Good morning in America, good afternoon in Europe, good evening in Asia, and welcome to this IISS webinar on France and Germany's responses to Russia's war in Ukraine. I'm Nigel Davis, a senior fellow for Russia and Eurasia at the IISS. France and Germany share much in common. Following Russia's first invasion of Ukraine in 2014, both were participants in the Minsk process that sought to end that war. Since February this year, they have both emphatically supported Ukraine against Russia's second invasion. But there are differences too. In particular, Germany's leadership has openly acknowledged the failure of its previous Russia policy. It has recognized the need to think in new ways about Russia and its potential position in or outside of the future post-war order. France's response is more ambiguous. It has much less clearly parted with past illusions about its Russian policy. What are the drivers of each country's thinking on these issues? How might this thinking evolve? And what are the implications for European security? I'm delighted to be discussing these questions today with two excellent colleagues. Rim Montaz, sitting next to me, is a consultant research fellow for European foreign policy and security at the IISS. Among many, many other things, she is a multiple Emmy Award winning journalist. Sarah Rain is a consulting senior fellow for geopolitics and strategy at the IISS. And among many, many other things, she is a former diplomat at the British Foreign Office. So welcome everyone. Uh, and to get us going, just thinking about these issues, I think it's helpful to glance back to uh, where France and Germany were in their thinking about Russia before this latest invasion in February. So how had French and German policy evolved in the years leading up to this fundamental rupture in European security? Uh, Grim, can I turn to you first and give us the French perspective? On this? Yes, of course. And thank you, uh, Nigel. I'm delighted to be here. Um, so just to uh, do a quick recap of, of, of the history, I'll start with 2017, where Macron gets elected. Emmanuel Macron becomes French president. You'll all recall that uh, when he was running for president, he was his campaign was targeted by uh, Russian hackers uh, because Russia really was much more supportive of uh, the candidacy of his far-right um, competitor, Marine Le Pen. Uh, and right after, a couple of weeks after he became president, Macron invited uh, the Russian president, uh, Vladimir Putin, to Versailles to have uh, uh, a meeting. And it was quite a frank uh, meeting in which, you know, during the press conference, he didn't shy away from uh, mentioning the hack, but also calling out Sputnik and Russia Today as propaganda tools. And so he seemed to be off to uh, quite a, a, a strong position toward uh, Russia. And then as you know, the years went on, Macron started trying to find a way to work uh, more cooperatively uh, with Russia. In 2018, he attempted to uh, carry out a humanitarian uh, operation uh, in uh, Syria, uh, a humanitarian delivery really out of the airbase that the Russian military was using basically to bomb civilians. So that did not go down very well. It was actually perceived as perhaps the way to whitewash uh, that, that airbase, maybe. Uh, and then, of course, in 2019, he invited um, Putin to the summer residence of French presidents in Brigançon uh, for uh, a summit right before hosting the G7 in Delhi. Now, the issue with that meeting is that, according to uh, Eastern European, German, and Baltic uh, officials, they were all pretty much blindsided by it. Uh, it wasn't something that was discussed uh, really on a European level, even though it was the um, kicking off point for what Macron uh, called the beginning of a dialogue to establish a new architecture of trust and security. That was followed by uh, the setting up of a two plus two format, meaning the, the foreign ministers and the defense ministers of France and Russia started meeting regularly, set up about a dozen 
um, working groups in order to uh, start giving uh, a body to that um, program of uh, the architecture of trust and security. And about a year, a year and a half into it, uh, you know, the def former defense minister, a uh, French defense minister, Florence Parly, actually said that it just wasn't working, that it, it hadn't produced anything. But one moment where it may have been actually quite useful is in the run-up to uh, the Russian invasion of Ukraine. In uh, November, if I'm not mistaken, of 2021, um, just as, I have to say, the French establishment, publicly but also in private briefings, um, was expressing a lot of doubt about the U.S. intelligence, raising the alarm uh, around an imminent uh, Russian intervention and invasion uh, of Ukraine. At the same time, this is what's interesting, when uh, the 2 plus 2 meeting did happen, so uh, the French and Russian sides did meet, and I was told by French officials that it was very important at that moment in November to have actual access to Shoigu, the um, Russian defense minister, in order to give him quite a stern message. And it was interesting, at that point, the French declared uh, that they had told uh, Russia that if Russia uh, was going to um, uh, attack the territorial integrity of Ukraine, it would suffer uh, massive and strategic consequences. So that was an interesting position to take. Uh, of course, the French continued to not really believe the, the intelligence coming out of the U.S. Even though, you know, French President Emmanuel Macron kept talking to, uh, to his uh, Russian counterpart and in fact went all the way to Moscow at the beginning of February in that now you know, infamous five hour long meeting across that very long table um, in a last ditch attempt uh, to uh, perhaps dissuade Putin from, from invading, and of course we know how that ended. Thank you very much, and it's helpful to be reminded of uh, some of uh, President Macron's rhetoric back in 2019, certainly from a, a Russia-watching perspective, there was some disconcertment about, the, uh, uh, about the, uh, the language of bringing Russia in from cold, protecting against China, I think that was part of it, and even that NATO was brain dead. Mm. It was, yeah, he, he, he declared that NATO was brain dead about two months after hosting uh, Putin in Brégançon, which of course didn't help at all with calming down his partners. And what he did say about Russia is that he's doing all of this with Russia because he needs Russia to be, to stay connected and tied to Europe as opposed to letting it get away from Europe and attach itself to China. That was his perspective. Yeah, yeah thank you. And also, of course, that, as you say, that infamous long table. And You'll be aware that since the war began, uh, Russia has coined this new verb, Macronit, uh, to, 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 to phone endlessly to no great purpose. But maybe we'll, maybe yeah, we'll, 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 we'll look at that a little later. Thank you very much. Sarah, over to you. Can you just give us a, a sense of the direction of travel and thinking of German policy towards Russia up to the point of the invasion in February? Thank you very much, Nigel. I think my starting point for this story would be uh, Germany's Energiewende, which is basically its transition to renewable energy, uh, where the um, importance of nuclear energy was becoming increasingly apparent as Germany basically tried to ramp up its wind and solar production. But then, of course, you have Fukushima uh, and Merkel is forced to do effectively a U-turn on um, uh, the future of nuclear power to revert to a plan that was originally passed by Schroeder and the Greens, which basically means switching off the country's last nuclear reactor in 2022 at a time when uh, nuclear power accounts for about a fifth of Germany's electricity generation. And what that basically means is that you have in the industrial powerhouse of Europe a country with a big electricity hole to fill at a time when coal is increasingly unattractive due to uh, surges in carbon pricing uh, and basically in need of natural gas, which pollutes less than coal in order to fill this hole. So you that brings us to the story of Nord Stream because it is therefore immensely politically and economically convenient to persistently portray, as Germany did, its willful failure to think strategically about energy security 
as a sort of deference to a project that was purely commercial and that needed, if anything, to be protected from geopolitical tensions. And this included, as relations were becoming worse, you know, this included, for example, the poisoning, if you remember, of Alexander Navalny, Russian opposition leader. You know, Navalny is recovering from poisoning in a hospital in the Charité in Berlin, and still Merkel is defending Nord Stream 2 as a purely commercial project. And I think the very first questioning we actually have is actually from Foreign Minister Heiko Maas, if I'm right, saying that unless Russia can push an investigation uh, into how Navalny was poisoned, then the future of Nord Stream 2 might be in doubt. But, but basically, you have this huge debate outside of Germany on Germans positioning uh, diplomatically and economically towards Russia, but very little debate inside of Germany. And this, I think, is moving on to the politics, I think, for two reasons. One is a slight consequence, if you like, of the Trump years, because Trump's sort of policy, if you like, of maximum pressure on Germany to forego uh, Nord Stream 2 actually slightly disempowers other German partners in Europe from voicing their opposition as they might have done, although they were doing it pretty clearly in private. Because fundamentally, there's a slight discomfort with these extraterritorial sanctions and the extent of their reach. And so a lot of the opposition to Nord Stream 2 uh, gets caught up in this slight sort of, well, this is Trump, America first, not really understanding that Russia is our neighbor and is too easily and readily dismissed. And then you have in 2021, of course, Biden coming into office and uh, seeking to re-establish close European partnerships. And that then leads to this dynamic where by July 2021, as basically Russia is increasingly signaling its intent uh, to launch a full-scale invasion of Ukraine, we've got the Medvedev article, we've got the Putin article. At this very moment, you know, you have a joint statement of the US and Germany on support for Ukraine, European energy security and climate goals, which is sort of compromise thing that says, look, in the event of any further aggressive acts, then Germany will look at the European level about more sanctions and they might or might not include Nord Stream 2. Um, so a lot of the politics of it, if you like, are wrapped up. And actually, there's more discussion at this point going on about Germany's relationship with the US and the future of the transatlantic relationship than there is about the future of relations with Russia. And then finally, I think, is the experience of the Minsk process, the Normandy format and the Minsk process, which I would argue, and we might come on to this, it's actually really important still in German thinking today, because many of the people were, who were instrumental in um, uh, running these negotiations are, of course, the very people who are now uh, sitting in the chancellery advising uh, the chancellor and advising the foreign minister. But fundamentally, you have Germany basically extremely proud, along with France, of the Normandy format. This is Europe taking the lead, taking care of problems uh, without the US uh, needing to lean in. And you also have, and I do think this is important for the future, this 13-point agreement in terms of Minsk II, which mixes political political and military commitments, but it's quite unclear on sequencing. So actually, you have quite a lot of grumbles with Kiev at the time, as well as with uh, Moscow in terms of whose fault it is that Minsk II really isn't progressing and working out as uh, the partners had hoped. Um, and so you lead, this leads us, I mean, Rim was talking about uh, uh, Macron's sort of enthusiasm for diplomacy, but I mean, I want to finish with just reminding us that again, in June 2021, Merkel and Macron are working closely together to try and force effectively um, an EU summit with Putin Onto, uh, onto the agenda. And actually it's other EU leaders pushing back saying, what are you thinking? This is not acceptable and not appropriate at this point. Thank you very much. And as you reminded, it wasn't only the, the Minsk uh, agreement of the Normandy format, but then specifically later on the Steinmeier formula. Uh, and, and in fact, people uh, sometimes forget that uh, even from President Zelensky in his first months in office appear to be ready to explore some, some version of that. Um, soon after he was uh, elected. So, but the larger picture, it seems, is uh, for Germany, Russia policy has energy policy, uh, and, a, and a country that never suffered a, a tsunami, um, responding to a tsunami in ways that made it seem to be more, more dependent. That's, that's very interesting. Thank you. Before we move on to, um, to the invasion, just to pick up a final point. So, Rim 
present a very clear picture of French policy as President Macron's policy. Uh, yet in the case of Germany, we have an election and a new government, indeed a coalition government, taking office towards the end of last year. Now, did that change anything at all in the kind of the tenor or the balance of influences on Germany's Russia policy? I would argue that it changed less than commentators at the time might have hoped. I mean, fundamentally, Chancellor Schultz arrives in office having won an election on the back of presenting himself very much as the continuity candidate. Um, and that uh, whilst we must, I think, acknowledge the uh, Green Party leadership who went into that election campaign with their leaders very clear about the threats that Russia presented, frankly, far ahead of their SPD colleagues in terms of, you know, Robert Harbeck in July 2021 uh, is arguing that uh, Germany should be sending arms to Ukraine to help the country prepare its defences against future Russian aggression. And we have Merkel's spokesman basically responding that actually, you know, the Chancellery followed responsible policies regarding arms exports. It's a sort of dismissive comment. And I think that sort of dismissiveness to perceived um, uh, German green hawkishness has continued. And actually, when you look at the policy positions and statements of Anna Lena Baerbock, the German foreign minister now, she's been very clear on what she would like to see. I mean, the interesting thing for me is, although this is a coalition government um, and the Greens have the foreign ministry, I'm still not seeing enough Green Party influence, frankly, follow through on uh, what the German policies are, are on Russia, basically. And so actually, I would say it's a more continuity than change. Uh, and that's not surprising, given that Schultz was a pretty key figure in the as finance minister in the previous government. Um, and now, of course, as Chancellor, and the, the likes of um, Jens Plötner, his foreign and security policy advisor, were, of course, at the AA, at the Auswärtige Amt, the German Foreign Office, um, helping design uh, Minsk II agreements. Thank you. We'll, we'll look uh, a little later at how those coalition relations and reflexes have, have played themselves out uh, since the invasion. But let's, let's, uh, let's move on from... Uh, that dramatic moment, 24th of February. And I'll come back to you, Sarah, again for this first. So, from energy vendor to Zeitung vendor. So, can you just briefly summarize this uh, to the rest of us, you know, non German especially, if not seen that a dramatic and profound and decisive break with the past? What did that amount to, and what, what explains the, the extent of it? So first off, of course, we have the cancellation of Nord Stream 2 that happens just before the uh, the Russian full-scale invasion, but on Putin's recognition of the two breakaway republics as Russian territory. Uh, we then have, I think on the 27th of February, the infamous Zeitenbender speech, where basically Chancellor Schultz goes uh, with, I would say, impressively, you know, I mean, actually fairly limited coordination, it now looks like, with his own SPD party. And he stands before the Bundestag and he basically makes it very clear that Germany is unconditionally committed to its NATO defence obligations, including immediately spending 2% of its GDP on defence and announcing this 100 billion extra budgetary fund that is going to be used on procurement to help sort of bridge uh, through to 2025 the funding gap that uh, this 2% commitment presents. So we get an awful lot of sort of very positive coverage, as you said, Nigel, in the introduction, uh, a clear break, apparently, recognising policy mistakes of the past and a clear break. And I think this is seen in three ways. One, firstly, that finally a debate on Germany's positioning vis-a-vis -vis Russia is no longer only happening externally, outside and beyond German borders, but it is now very much a live one internally. Secondly, that we are seeing uh, the value of military force recognized, that we have years of persistent underfunding of the German armed forces and broken procurement for promises. And that is now widely understood 
as a mistake. And, and you see, you know, the foreign minister, Annalena Baerbock, a German foreign minister, standing side by side with Stoltenberg in May 2022, saying, look what's just happened. This is precisely why we need NATO. And, and when I had the pleasure of living in Berlin uh, for the past sort of eight, nine years, uh, when I first arrived, I spent a lot of time talking uh, to contacts and uh, friends in the Foreign Office about CSDP. Um, and uh, whilst there were contacts and friends in the Defence Ministry who were very happy to talk about NATO as the cornerstone of European defence, there was an awful lot of political energy being put into CSDP. And I think you would start to see, uh, and this is one of the sort of slight divergences on France and Germany now, um, a real recognition of NATO as absolutely fundamental and the value of the transatlantic relationship to European defence. Excellent, thank you very much. Uh, now, Rim, uh, again, for the non-French experts, it seems that there hasn't been anything like the, the Zeitenwende, everyone will translate that into French, a less obviously dramatic break with uh, the past, either rhetorically or in policy practice. Is that correct? And if so, what, what would explain that different response? Well, I think there are several components to this. One, I think it's fair to say that the French military doesn't need to uh, go through such a revolutionary process because the French state never stopped investing in uh, its military. In fact, it's been one of the, let's say, issues that makes perhaps France a bit of a difficult ally sometimes within NATO, right? Their obsession with maintaining uh, a, a capable uh, military as much as their own budget allows uh, and a military that is capable of doing things on their own, perhaps as much on their own as is possible because as we know even in the Sahel they, they need US assistance in, in, in some specific ways of course. Um, so on, on that level the French don't feel like they need to be investing 100 billion into, into their, their armed forces even though uh, they have been actually increasing their military budgets. Uh, Macron's first term increased the budget and now he's continuing to invest and increase the budget even though when you speak with um, the chiefs of staff of course they continue to say that you know, it's not enough, they need, they need more and more investments. So in that way there was no need to do something similar to, to the German uh, sort of Zeit But in terms of the diplomatic and political positioning, uh, it's true that we have not, and I don't think that we will, uh, hear anyone across the French political uh, spectrum uh, come out and say that their position toward Russia is going to change from their desire and constant attempts to try to find a way to build some sort of partnership. Um, and there are various reasons for that. So one, just in terms of the political context in, in France, you have to keep in mind that during the April presidential election in 2022, Macron was the least friendly to Russia. That's the spectrum you need to put him on. He was running against four main candidates who were more pro-Russian than he was. So his positioning also takes that into consideration. He is almost a hawk in the French political context, of course. That doesn't mean that the entire French society shares his position. It doesn't. In fact, there's a bit of a divorce between how the elite in France, whether it's the political, intellectual, um, cultural, diplomatic elite, perceives Russia and, and wants to think of French relationship with Russia and the way sort of the average person uh, as, as seen in polling perceives Russia. So that's that's the first um, uh, reason, right? It's political. And why is that political? It's tied to their own uh, sort of history, uh, their own geopolitical history. And I'm not going to go back all the way to World War II, even though that's really where it starts. But you have to think of how the French system has processed or not the loss of the French um, power in that sense. They still have a hard time accepting that they are not a great power, but rather they are a medium-sized power. Um, and they see Russia as a, a possible partner that would allow France, and through France, Europe, 
uh, to balance out the US and Chinese giants. And that's always in the back of their mind. They always want to maintain some sort of um, independence uh, toward the US positioning. So you can see it on China policy, you definitely see it on Russia. And it's also why you, in France, here more often than not, and even since the invasion of Ukraine, uh, a lot of former diplomats, former foreign ministers, current politicians uh, have repeatedly said, well, Russia was pushed into a corner because NATO was expanding, and really NATO shares in the responsibility of this invasion, and the US shares in the responsibility of this invasion, and by the way, the US is benefiting and profiting economically. So, you know, we need to look at that in a way that's a little more suspicious. So that's the context in, in, in which, you know, French positioning toward Russia um, exists. But there is something shifting a bit because of Russia's behavior. So Russia has been uh, attacking French interests uh, and stoking anti-French sentiment in Western Africa for the better part of two years in a way that has been extremely severe. And that has led to a hardening of uh, some of the rhetoric uh, coming out of Macron and others in the system toward Russia. We saw it uh, when Macron was in um, Cameroon, Guinea-Bissau, uh, in, uh, I think it was July, where he very pointedly said, you know, there is Russian-fueled disinformation uh, and, uh, uh, you know, a campaign against, against France. Whether he actually draws conclusions and changes his positioning and his policy toward Russia is yet to be seen, and I'm a little dubious about that. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Very interesting that, that that last point too about the about the role of Russia in Africa and how that's challenging French interests. You also referred to the to the, the long shadow that that, that I suppose Gaullist, Gaullist thinking yeah. uh, plays, and Atlantic to the Urals is the phrase that we. Remember that. It seems, to, seems to have an eternal afterlife, that, that, that kind of... Yes, yeah, so, I mean, poor General de Gaulle, he is constantly, uh, you know, mentioned, whether it's from far right to the far left politicians, by the way, in France, uh, they always try to use them to, to justify their position, but they forget that, in fact, despite the fact that de Gaulle, of course, wanted to uh, preserve France's ability to uh, act on its own, uh, he always stood with the US and the Western Bloc in the major crises that they had to go through together. And in a way that made him a steadfast ally. And that is something sometimes that is perhaps forgotten in the current French um, debate mm -hmm. about how to position. Thank you. Just, just to pick up that point, so Sarah reminded us that the, uh, the Ru second Russian invasion of Ukraine uh, and this shocking use of uh, extreme uh, military power uh, in Europe uh, reminded or reaffirmed in German minds the value of NATO. Uh, what role did that play in Macron's mind, recalling those brain dead references that he had been making not long before? Has there been a shift there? Does he think NATO is, is, is unbrain dead? Or I, it's unclear, honestly, but what you have to look at also what he's done, and the truth is, as soon as the war started, and actually right before the war started, uh, France did um, beef up its uh, positioning and its posture when it comes to deterrence posture on the eastern flank of, of the alliance. So uh, they hadn't, France hadn't taken over as a framework nation in any of the enhanced forward presence of NATO in the Baltic states, uh, but they did establish uh, one in Romania as soon as the war started, and they are the framework nation there. They beefed up their role in terms of the air policing uh, on the eastern flank, um, and so in that way, they have also extended their uh, contribution to the EFP in Estonia. Um, so they have been uh, you know, they have done what they needed to do within the NATO alliance, no question about it. They've sent reinforcements. Whether they are going to change uh, fundamentally the way they perceive NATO, I think that is a long shot. Um, 
it doesn't mean that they're going to leave NATO. And the reason why I was saying that Macron is perhaps the most hawkish of the current political crop is because at least two of the main presidential candidates who were running against him had wanted to uh, pull France out of the integrated command of NATO if they had become president. So that is something that is still part of the French debate, unfortunately. Reminding us where, where President Macron sits on the spectrum of politicians, that's been very, very salutary and helpful. Uh, reminder, and you've also touched on the question of of, of what uh, what France has done in practice. And Sarah, I take up this uh, this theme with you. So Zeitenwende, dramatic speech, all of that. What, in concrete, practical terms, has German support for Ukraine and resistance and opposition to Russia meant over time? Very good. Um, yes, this is where the rubber hits the road, isn't it? Because Zeitenwende certainly doesn't mean leading. In fact, it seems to mean, uh, with regard to Ukraine policy, watching what the US is doing, or at least specifically what the White House is doing. I think there's very close contact between, uh, as you would want there to be, between Jens Plutner and Jake Sullivan, uh, and then sort of tucking in behind and sort of doing just about enough to uh, to not get called out too much, at least by official counterparts, if not by the wider media. And I think, you know, there's something sort of a little bit uneasy about announcing a Zeitenwende and then basically repeatedly justifying your actions on the basis of a need for unity and, and sort of being in concert with your NATO partners, which is sort of implicitly suggesting that, that that's what's driving your thinking rather than know so much that you understand that Germany's security interests are for Ukraine to successfully repel Russia's invasion, right? So I think there have been, um, I mean, I, I don't want to get too much onto the leopards debate, but I think there have been some pretty terrible comms around what Germany has actually done on Zeitenwende, in particular with regard to Ukraine. And so if I can just sort of take the opportunity, they have done, you know, clearly too little too late. And we have this consistent sort of putting their foot in it. They're their own worst enemies, honestly. You know, basically, Schultz says, oh, Germany has a clear policy of not delivering arms to crisis regions, and that includes not sending lethal weapons to Ukraine. What happens, you know, just after refusing permission even for Estonia to export old German howitzers to Ukraine, inevitably, of course, by the 26th of February, Germany is announcing that it's sending anti-tank weapons and stinger surface to air missiles. And then we have most of April where, again, the Chancellor says, well, we're not delivering heavy weaponry. We can deliver weapons, but, but not heavy weapons. Um, and he gives an interview where he basically says that we can't deliver heavy weapons because we don't have enough of them and we're worried about nuclear war. And four days later, after at least four days after the interview is published, to be fair, Germany then sends 50 decommissioned uh, Gepard anti-aircraft tanks to Ukraine. <laughs> You know, it said it wouldn't send howitzers, and then it does. And so it's this constant play and catch up with its own sort of uh, comms. But if I can just take the chance to say what it has done, because I do think that sometimes um, when we read about how little and late Germany has to be to the game, we might not appreciate what they have actually done in terms of military assistance to Ukraine. So there's a study by the Kiel Institute for the World Economy that's looked at 15 countries that have made military bilateral commitments in Europe to Ukraine by weapons and equipment deliveries and financial aid with a military purpose. And it looks at it from January the 24th to October the 3rd. So, you know, first obviously going to be the UK, 1.5 billion euros of weapons deliveries and 2.3 billion in financial aid with a military purpose. Second, again, no surprises, Poland, 1.8 billion euro uh, weapons deliveries. Third, Germany, 0.78 billion euros of weapons and 0.5 billion in financial aid with a military purpose. France, just out of interest, is 10th um, with 0.2 billion euros. So when I then look at what German military aid actually looks like, I mean, you know, there's real problems with the Ring Tausch program, which we can sort of uh, discuss if we want to get into the details. But fundamentally, Germany's actually not done a bad job of trying to encourage uh, Central and Eastern European and empower Central and Eastern European countries that are sending kits, military kits to Ukraine to do so and upgrade their capabilities at the same time. So Slovenia sent 28 M M55S tanks to Ukraine in exchange for equipment from Germany. Czechia 
40 T-72 M1 tanks in exchange for Leopard tanks. Greece, 40 BMP 1A infantry fighting vehicles in exchange again for 30 Marders from Germany. Slovakia, 30 BFP first uh, infantry fighting vehicles in exchange for 15 Leopards. So you're starting to see sort of, you know, lots, that's not failure. It's not good enough. And I know we can move on to the leopards, but 50 dingo armored vehicles, again, too little, too late. That compares to 90 Bushmasters from Australia or 80 uh, armored fighting vehicles from the UK. But we are, you know, now basically sending tracked self-propelled howitzers. Germany supplied 10 already with four more on their way. Orders for 18 artillery cannons, five Mars, multiple <laughs> rocket launchers on order you know, 20 laser guided rockets. I mean, I've got the whole list in front of me. I did quite a lot of research to try and look at what had actually arrived as well as what had been ordered. And it's not quite as uh, awful on the military as we uh, as sometimes portrayed. And I think there's just a third point I'd like to make, if I may, which is in other ways. I mean, Baerbock, I thought, paid quite a good speech in the Bundestag quite early on, where her argument was, let's recognise what each of us allied partners are good at and let's do that right so you know what's the uk good at is good at exporting weapons and defense intelligence so that's what the uk that's its chief it's less good frankly on taking you know huge numbers of migrants uh, from ukraine and if you look at what germany has been doing beyond military assistance I mean, in particular, I would say, actually, with the attacks on energy infrastructure, actually, what does Ukraine need at the moment and going forward? It's spare parts, it's transformers, it's basically mobilizing uh, the Ukrainian and helping repair and mobilize alternatives so that the Ukrainian national grid can survive a deliberate targeting of infrastructure. And there... German industry and German government has been, and I haven't seen a really good analysis of this yet written, but it looks like Germany is playing a reasonable stroke, quite impressive role uh, there at least. The, the picture that emerges is that while many countries, particularly in matters of aid, overpromise and underdeliver, that Germany's done the opposite. It's so underpromised or, or not advertised its, its, uh, uh, its achievements uh, particularly effectively, but it's provided more and more over time than most of us uh, realize. Would that be fair? I, I think that's very fair. I mean, as I say, I think a lot of this, it's consistent sort of, it's just, they're not on top of the messaging and the comms, but the actual substance isn't quite as bad as is uh, often portrayed. So yes, I think that would be extremely fair. Now that doesn't mean that Germany couldn't and shouldn't be doing more. And that's a debate that we can come on to in Q&A. But I do think it is important that instead of hammering Germany all the time for how little it's doing, to recognise that actually, you're talking about a coalition of, a, you know, a Green Party, who whilst the leadership might be on record by 2021 as happy to send lethal exports to Ukraine, fundamentally, that's quite a challenge for a Green Party base. And then you're talking about an SPD-led chancellery where I think the chancellor and those in chancellery actually really do understand the seriousness of this. They have no delusions about returning to the status quo ante. But fundamentally, this is a party with the history of detente. It's a party where you still have, you know, one of the leaders, uh, SPD leaders in, you know, in the Bundestag, Mützenich, uh, basically uh, consistently looking for more diplomatic initiatives and criticising his own chancellery for the lack of diplomatic engagement. It's a party where actually, you know, the poor German ambassador, the Ukrainian ambassador to Germany, who was a slightly undiplomatic uh, ambassador to Germany, Andrei Melnik, you know, the co-leader of the SPD is basically taunting him, Eskin, Saskia Eskin, saying, look, you're in the wrong job and diplomacy is really not your thing. <laughs> Um, it's a pretty difficult, complicated domestic environment. And in those circumstances, you know, I think we should appreciate what Chancery has done as well as asking them to do more. Maybe a related way of putting this would be to say if we, if we judge uh, countries' policies by how far they've moved since the invasion began, perhaps Germany has done better than most or, or possibly even all other states. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. I think the one point I would make is I still don't think there's been quite the reckoning with the past that uh, we're potentially assuming there has been. So I don't think that there's enough discussion of past policy failures 
it, so I said that there is more of a debate on the future of Russia relations inside Germany now, but I'm not sure there's really been much of a debate on how we got ourselves into the situation and the policy failures basically that have been made. And I would also say that the one issue I do have with the Zeitung vendor is that it's almost like it presents that somehow on February the 24th, the world turned upside down and everything was fine. And then on like February the 24th, we suddenly realized, oh my gosh, this is the new world we live in. And that's almost, you hear some of that with Steinmeier's, President Steinmeier's speech recently this month. And I'm not sure that's fair. You know, actually the UK, the US and other allies have been persistently warning about the realities of President Putin's Russia for years. And certainly right up until the day of invasion, those messages were really not being heard to the extent that you end up with this ridiculous situation. And I'm sure he now says it was all planned, but you know, the head of the BND is, is caught in Kiev on the day that uh, the invasion launches and has to be rescued out sort of by road with the help of Polish special forces or whatever. I mean, it's, it's lunatic. Yeah, yeah, fascinating. A couple more quick questions, then we'll open up to Q&A. We'll get some questions already. So we've discussed the past, the, the, the prologue to responses to the invasion. Uh, and then we've discussed the course of those responses and what they've meant in practice. But now we're glancing ahead, it's not too soon to begin to think about what the shape of a post-war order might look like. It's very difficult to be very precise while the outcome of the war itself remains uncertain. But there are certainly people in the chancellors across Europe and beyond thinking about what the future of European and indeed Western security might look like. So um, can you offer any insights into what thinking is around those questions in first in France and then, and then in Germany? Yeah, I mean, in France, obviously, from the beginning, they've been uh, tilting much more toward uh, speeding up any kind of diplomatic uh, process that they can uh, put together, which is why Macron keeps uh, doing his phone diplomacy. Uh, I mean, I was counting the number of times he's been on the phone. So since February, he's been on the phone with Vladimir Putin at least 15 times. Uh, that's without his, his meeting with him. And with Zelensky, it's been at least 32 times. So at least he, he speaks to the Ukrainian side more than he speaks to, uh, to Putin. And he has tried multiple times from the beginning to um, negotiate even small resolutions. So when Mariupol was uh, under uh, siege, he tried to uh, negotiate with Putin some sort of uh, evacuation route. It didn't work out, but at least he tried to do it. Uh, he's been on the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant uh, uh, file from the beginning trying to uh, you know create a space for the IAEA to go in in a safe way or as safe as possible and to protect as much as possible that power plant now it's a painstaking process uh, it hasn't given us a, a great win yet but he's continuing the grain deal it's interesting because France did a lot of the um, a legwork for the grain deal was supposed to be part of the deal and in the end the deal was done between uh, the UN, Turkey and, and, and Russia and France wasn't a part of it and that is sort of the diplomatic win that he, he didn't get. So that's sort of the, the diplomacy that, that he's doing. Um, in terms of how do they see this war ending, now you will recall that Macron angered pretty much the entire world that is with Ukraine and appalled by Russia at the beginning of this war by repeatedly coming out and saying, uh, you know, Russia should not be humiliated, we need to find a face-saving solution for Russia. At least he has, for the time being, we never know with Emmanuel Macron, but for the time being, he has stopped saying these words. He seems to have understood that right now saying them is counterproductive. That being said, he was in Rome a few weeks ago and he talked about the importance of peace, And but he said that you know peace will happen when you, Ukrainians will be ready for it. And a lot of people um, attacked him for saying that, as if he was saying that it was up to the Ukrainians to decide to stop fighting. That is not what he was actually saying. What he was saying is, you know, he's taken on board um, the, the previous criticism and he's trying to say that he won't impose uh, a peace on the Ukrainians that the Ukrainians don't want. Now that's what's publicly said. 
Now, obviously, uh, the French president, like other Western leaders, are starting to worry about the long-term consequences of a war, this war, dragging on much, much longer. What that means for energy prices, what that means for their, for their economies, what that means for their popular support, because they have to face you know, elections over and over. And of course, they would rather, sooner than later, uh, Ukraine and Russia start talking. The issue with the position, and we've heard that the US administration has been starting to privately signal to the Ukrainians that they need to at least signal publicly that they're open to some sort of conversation, doesn't mean that it's gonna happen right now. The, the reason why it's different when it comes from France is because unlike the US, France wasn't very enthusiastic at the beginning of the war in terms of giving uh, military aid to Ukraine that would have been decisive. They were late to that game and for many, many months they refused to even say what they were doing, claiming that it was to preserve operational security and then suddenly when public uh, pressure rose too much, they finally gave us a list of what they've given, which is howitzers and, and, defense, and air defense systems and, and anti-tank guided missiles, all of which, of course, are, are helpful to, to the Ukrainians. So this is where Macron's positioning is a little uh, weaker. And then I will just end on this, which has been really uh, surprising watching Macron trying to navigate this. He who spent years, at least five years, uh, telling his European allies that they need to wake up, that they need to um, build more military uh, capability, that they need to build what he likes to call European strategic autonomy because, well, the US under Trump, but not just under Trump, is not always going to be here for Europe and that their US priorities are shifting towards China. It was very surprising, given that context, that he didn't, he was not uh, at the forefront of the military response to Ukraine in a way to show his allies, a lot of whom, the European partners, doubted his sincerity and doubted the reliability of France. It was a perfect opportunity for him to step up to the plate, lead by example, and show them that there is another security partner to be had. Of course, no one can ever rise to the level of the US just don't, don't have the firepower or the economic power, but at least he could have given them more reason to trust him. He did exactly the opposite. And that has, I think, weakened his position. And it will be interesting to see whether that affects his ability to, to broker a, a diplomatic deal if and when the time comes. Back on the broker, potentially, is that, is that, that part that, of the aspiration? That's, that's definitely his aspiration, yeah. Very, very interesting. Thank you. Sarah, the shape, shape of a post-war post order. Am I right in thinking that Foreign Minister Baerbock recently said something along the lines of, we, we've already thought of building security with Russia, we now need to build it against Russia, something like that. So what is the, the mix of German thinking on these questions? Yeah, I mean, there's certainly some shaping messages going on, isn't there, between the foreign ministry and the chancellery in terms of this battle for where German government's policy should come out. Um, I think my starting point for thinking on this is that um, is, is, is the Germans are actually really quite humble on this. There's a reality that basically it is US, its military support and its outreach that is going to, if anybody is going to be whispering and talking to the Ukrainians, the Russians, it's the US that will basically be deciding decisive in that. And that uh, Germany is not in the business as uh, it's often sort of in the early days, France and Germany were often accused of, of being risking whispering in Zelensky's ear one thing or another. It's in the business of supporting Zelensky to strengthen his hand for when negotiations come. But when those negotiations come, what they look like, that's something that if you're a policy advisor right now sitting in Chancellery, you have to recognize the limits of your agency here and accept that actually, and I think that they do, and this is one of the issues really in thinking through this, is that um, it, it'll be the US that will lead on this and indeed are leading. And actually there's a danger of getting burnt quite badly if actually you set out publicly your sort of vision for the future. Um, so I think there's a lot of caution 
discussion going on. That said, we do know, of course, that the US are thinking this through at the moment and that they have asked uh, certainly quad partners for their input into what uh, would be and should be acceptable for them in terms of a future end uh, state of relations. And that, that some of that thinking, you know, it will clearly be very closely protected, but it is being fed into the system at the moment, but with a certain nervousness, as I say, about going too publicly on this, because privately there's a concern that we haven't really defined what sustainable levels of support look like and that we do need to manage expectations, but it's just not Germany's place to lead here. And that there's this fear that basically political ambitions are out of kilter with military ambitions. And, and I would say that's the same for both sides. Um, but, you know, this is a dynamic um, war effort. And the problem we have with thinking too far ahead in terms of what an end state could be like is, you know, recent polling in Ukraine said that basically 70 percent of Ukrainians want to continue the war until victory is achieved. And importantly, for 91 percent of those polled, at least uh, victory was defined as recapturing all seized territory, including Crimea. Now, that sort of ch policy challenge is really going to be very tricky indeed to navigate. Uh, and so I know there's thinking going on at the moment on future scenarios. How do you go about, A, even if you can get negotiations, uh, how do you prove any sort of serious, genuine intent for these negotiations, for any agreement to be anything more than a stopgap measure? But also, what can you do in particularly with regard to Crimea that allows both sides some sort of um, uh, way that they can claim sovereignty, even if you're looking at de facto and de jure sort of split. Um, but what you have to do at the moment is change the dynamic, you know, for Putin that a bad war is better than a bad peace. Um, and, and likewise, frankly, for Ukraine, although the war is obviously going better for them at the moment, but there are real challenges around sustainability. So long answer that basically it's a little bit too early for Germany to nail its colours to the mast here. It is sensibly waiting and watching for German lead for US leadership here. Um, uh, and the points where you will see more from Germany on this will be once negotiations are actually sort of starting. I think, Rim, if I may, Nigel, very quickly, made a really interesting point on, on French leadership in Europe. And I wonder if I could just sort of mirror that in terms of German leadership, because, you know, just like Rim said, this should have been on paper the perfect opportunity for um, France to say, here we are, we're a serious provider of security for our region. Um, and military assistance. And this is what we can offer. Likewise for Germany, remember this new coalition came to power and on paper, it looked like it was going to be this sort of perfect European partner, right? You've got this pro, you know, pro-European SPD, you've got the Green Party heavily invested again. And, and actually it just hasn't worked out like that. And there's been a real impact from Germany's too little, too late, poor communications on what it's actually doing in substance with uh, partners with Central and Eastern Europe. And you see that acknowledged with Schultz's visit to Prague, where, which of course annoys Macron and Rim, you'll know more about this than me, but, but annoys Macron yeah, endlessly. Um, but you see that with Schultz going to Prague and sort of almost acknowledging, yes, we haven't quite got this right. The center of gravity has shifted. And you see it as well with Foreign Minister Annalena Baerbock, who has really appreciated this point on, you know, German leadership within Europe and trying to salvage some sort of um, damage control, if you like, with Central and Eastern European nations. And, and that rift is not surprising, because I'll finish here with, with, again, you know, if you look at military donations by European states and you calculate them by percentage of annual military budget, okay? Now, I appreciate that's a crazy way of, of, of looking at what's um, uh, substantively in terms of helping Ukraine. But actually, if Latvia donates 41% of its military budget to Ukraine, and Estonia donates 37% of its military budget to Ukraine, then, you know, when Germany donates 2.4% and France 0.5%, of course you're going to get very, very deep frustrations with any pretense of leadership. There's a fascinating question there about whether or the extent to which uh, thought leadership and creative and assertive policy on these issues is shifting east, shifting to the Central and East European member states, and what the implications are for the Franco-German axis that more than anything has traditionally driven EU policy 
Alas, we will have no time on this occasion to explore it, but we must do so in the future. We have just a few minutes left for some questions that have come in, and we welcome more if you'd like to type them in the chat. So here's one question, and it, it, let's try to ruffle through some of these quickly. So uh, just to follow up the, uh, the point about the, uh, the, point about the Zeitenbender, uh, Sarah, uh, there's a question here, uh, can we explain why this dramatic and welcome shift took place? Was it Chancellor Schultz, Schultz personally? Uh, was it his party? Was it the, the coalition? It still seems to me also um, not the obvious response. One could imagine something more modulated and limited, and perhaps at least in the initial days and weeks, more along the lines of what we saw in France. And this candid, uh, almost touchingly candid, self-flagellating acknowledgement of the failures of past policies. So briefly, is there anything that can help us understand that better? Yeah, I mean, I would give a lot of credit, actually, I would say, to the Chancellor personally, in terms of I'm not entirely sure that that was a Zeitenwender speech was particularly well cleared with his uh, party uh, leadership, um, or certainly his party faction in the Bundestag at all. Um, and why did it happen? Well, uh, there was a wake up call in terms of facts on the ground. And I think a genuine uh, a shock. I mean, basically, Germany had been being warned that this was going to happen and simply did not believe it. And there has to be a recalibration where every single bit of your system is basically ignoring the advice coming in from the UK and the US um, and, and, and thinking that you've got this understood and that Russia, you understand Russia so much better than anybody else does. So yes, it's sort of, we can say it's touching, but also fundamentally, I would have thought it was the least that they could do but that doesn't mean that they don't deserve some credit because it absolutely clearly, you know, to some extent, the SPD had to challenge its party base in terms of you have to tell people who basically thought that the answer to the future with Russia was to engage that now, at least for now, the answer is to isolate Russia diplomatically, economically, militarily, technologically. That is quite a shift. And again, for the Green Party, you have to tell a Green Party activist base that actually let's export lethal weapons and the heavier the better to a crisis zone in our part of the world. And for the FDP, who we haven't mentioned at all, but the third and long forgotten sort of coalition partner in Germany also, um, that actually we have to spend some money and break this sort of debt breaks in order to do this. Mm, mm, yeah. Let's also not forget the other arm of Western policy has been the escalating sanctions on Russia. Now eight EU sanctions packages, and that's not something that we could have taken for granted any more than the, the military support to Ukraine. We have a question here from our colleague in Singapore, the head of the IISS Asia office, James Crabtree. And he asks, how has the response of France and Germany to Ukraine changed their respective views and policies towards China? And I might just add as a fascinating question, I might just add a code to that. Are there any lessons learned from the retrospective failure of French and German policies towards Russia for future policies towards China? Really, many I mean, I have to say it's a completely different uh, ball game with China for, for France. First of all, there's none of the historic baggage that I discussed when it comes to Russia and when it comes to, to China. So that's that's the first thing. Uh, the, the positioning of Macron has not shifted and I don't think it will. He uh, perceives China as a partner on some things like climate change, which is something that is very important for foreign, French foreign policy, but also he, he sees it as a competitor and as an adversary. He sees it as a competitor uh, when it comes to a lot of uh, trade and economic issues and he does see it uh, as a kind of adversary, of course, in the Indo-Pacific, where he, he has been uh, sending the French Navy to uh, carry out a freedom of navigation uh, operations uh, in those seas. So he will continue to perceive it this way. He absolutely does not want to uh, align himself with what he perceives as too much of a hawkish American position towards China. So on that, it, there is a parallel with with Russia in in that way, but but that's very uh, very limited. And I will add, you know, Macron was very staunch. Uh, I think it was in 2019 about uh, blocking any uh, Chinese uh, tech companies from getting into the 5G uh, world in in France because uh, he wanted to protect sort of the strategic infrastructure there. And so he sees 
China as a, a possible threat. Um, I think there's much more of a question being asked when it comes to Germany. I know that Paris wasn't exactly delighted with uh, Scholz's uh, recent trip to, to China where he refused to do a joint trip with Macron, which is something that Macron has, it must be said, has been trying to consistently do throughout his first term and now his second term, try to only approach China mostly through a united European front because he understands that only united can they actually have enough weight. And sorry, one last thing, the one thing they look at right now with, with China in terms of the Russian war in Ukraine is they hope that China will at least try to dissuade uh, Russia from using nuclear weapons. Whether that is well-founded or not is another question. Very interesting. Thank you. Sarah, any quick thoughts on this? Uh, very quickly. I mean, I would say that uh, certainly, again, to give the Green Party leadership their credit, they've been fairly hawkish on China, they're fairly hawkish on Russia, and they would say we don't particularly need to learn any lessons, frankly. We have been the guys that have been right on this all along. Um, uh, on the SPD sort of line of this, I mean, you would have thought that there would be some lessons learned, wouldn't you, given, um, but actually what appears to have happened, if you look at this recent deal with uh, Costco trying to uh, take a minority stake in logistic firm HHLA, uh, one of its three terminals at the Hamburg port, uh, the compromise, you know, every part of the German establishment, including the Foreign Office uh, and the Ministry of Economy, both of which are controlled by the Greens, uh, was telling uh, the Chancellor that this was a bad idea. But actually, the compromise appears to be to say, no, no, it's an entirely commercial project. And instead of allowing them a 35% stake, well, we'll just allow a 24.9% stake. And that's somehow a lesson learned, really, is it? Uh, so I think there is still uh, a reluctance to follow through on an understanding that surely by now, we even say it in our EU-China strategy, China is a systemic rival. And I think that the outlook for Germany is, yes, we understand that it is a systemic rival, but maybe it's not quite so urgent to address that right now, given all the pressures that we're under with Russia and given uh, the pressures that we're experiencing uh, economically at the moment. So again, it's this sort of right idea, wrong urgency, um, and not necessarily the best comms uh, and timing around Schultz's visit. Although, again, I would say read his op-ed that he wrote in the FAZ when he justified the visit and what he was trying to achieve. Look at that press conference. You know, it was a bit of a departure from a Merkel press conference, at least in the mentioning of Taiwan and the focusing on the political aspects and the political problems in the relationship, albeit that we still had all the usual business delegates on the plane and that presentationally it did look a little bit too much like business as usual. That was a fascinating question. Lessons learned or not, is the Costco stake uh, the new Nord Stream 2? Uh, and, I mean, Tim and Ian, the... both of them have come up with something just to finish off on the French and German sort of relationship and the impact on this. And I think Rim and I have both sort of touched around this and that clearly it's not in a good place and that I don't think it does affect quad unity. So actually, I think if you look at the coordination at officials levels, at NSA levels, when you're thinking through policy to Russia, I'm quite impressed and actually pleasantly surprised by how well coordination is working there. However, in terms of the what are the lessons learned that you've just alluded to, Nigel, and what are the implications? What ought we to be doing cooperating together on EU defence and on improving defence capability? I think the French and the Germans are, are miles apart, frankly. And, and any final, final thoughts on that Franco-German relationship? We have had a couple of very interesting questions in uh, on that. Is, is that a difficult relationship? Is it hindering? Uh, wider cooperation? It's a very, uh, it's currently an extremely fraught relationship. I think it hasn't been this bad in a long, long time. Um, there are, I mean, personally, they don't get along, Schultz and, and Macron, there's no like chemistry, but also beyond that, uh, you can, there, there's, a, there's a change perhaps in, in the, uh, at least from the French perspective, in uh, the attitude coming out of uh, Berlin. Berlin is asserting itself more. Uh, France was really unhappy with uh, that speech that Schultz gave at, at Charles University, despite what Macron said about it publicly, where he, he welcomed it as a sort of in line with his Sorbonne speech from 2017. In truth, uh, they are very alarmed at the fact that he did not mention not once uh, the Franco-German defense uh, projects. Uh, they are worried about what that means for uh, FCAS, SCAF, uh, 
um, because that actually jeopardizes a good part of uh, French uh, military industry and, and aeronautical industry. So a lot is at stake for them. Uh, this is, they're not in a good place. When it comes to EU defense, this is a huge hindrance, no question about it, because no matter what the issues are with France, and we've gone over them, they remain an essential uh, defense actor in the European landscape, and so far, the only EU military that, has, that is battle-tested in every sense of the word, and actually has the political appetite and desire and will to go fight wars elsewhere. So unless the Germans who have the money and the, and the French who have kind of the, the, the military uh, know-how uh, can patch things up, EU defense and all that comes with it is not going to progress unfortunately. And just a quick addendum to that, if you see anything positive on FCAS between now and Christmas in terms of announcements forthcoming, it doesn't necessarily mean that what Reem and I were uh, arguing is wrong. It simply means that sort of token compromises have been uh, made in order to try and steady the boat, but that that steadying is still a work in progress very much. I would say it would mean that they uh, watched this webinar and listened to you both and drawn the right conclusions. Uh, with that, unfortunately, we must end. We've gone a little over the hour, but our, our rich and wide-ranging discussion has uh, entirely justified that. I'd like to, to thank Tom and Ryan, our uh, IT gurus, uh, and Sarah and Rim for taking part in this, uh, this splendid discussion, and everyone for joining us online. Everyone will have their own takeaways from this. It's just uh, three of mine. So firstly, to your point, uh, Sarah, thinking about a division of labor among European countries and contributing to supporting Ukraine or resisting Russia in the ways that, that work best for them, I think, is a, a healthy uh, and constructive way of, uh, rather than a finger-pointing way of, 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 uh, of thinking about these things. Um, and uh, secondly, your point, Rim, about that in the French political spectrum, Macron is a hawk, relatively speaking. I think that's, it's, you probably right at that. And finally, and this, 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 this concerns both countries, if we judge by deeds rather than occasionally wobbly or ambiguous words, I think there's, there's a pretty strong record for both countries here, uh, and increasingly over time, in fact. So resolve has stiffened rather than weakened, uh, and I think that's, that's impressive. Uh, much to uh, explore on a future occasion. Uh, many strands of this uh, wonderful conversation to, uh, to take up. But thank you, everyone, and uh, from a rainy London, a very good afternoon. Thank you.